You're watching The Context. It's time for our weekly segment, AI Decoded. Yes, it's that time of the week when we step back to look at all the key stories related to artificial intelligence. So let's start tonight with the New York Times, which reports on the dilemma that is facing Microsoft. In 1998, the company opened an advanced research lab in Beijing, which pioneers some of the work in artificial intelligence. But now, of course, as the tensions mount between China and the United States, Microsoft is being asked what it's going to do with it. Uh, the FT reports that in Denmark, scientists are using AI to calculate when people might die. The algorithm has a 79% accuracy rate, which on the face of it sounds rather gruesome, but they're hoping that kind of information will lead to a longer life. The Wall Street Journal says the US intelligence groups are using AI to stay one step ahead of the hackers who are trying to infiltrate and attack American infrastructure. You may recall that two years ago, oil supplies were shut down between New York and Texas by a ransomware attack on the Colonial Pipeline. We'll discuss that. Every fingerprint is unique, at least that's what I thought from watching CSI, but apparently it might not be the case. Engineers at Columbia University have discovered, with the help of AI, that our fingerprints may not be so unique after all. And finally, what impact will artificial intelligence have on comic books and animation? AI is already being used in the industry, but the verdict of one animator is that you won't win an Oscar with it. With me? One of our regular experts, Stephanie Hare, is here, author and AI commentator. Lovely to see you. Happy New Year. Happy New Year. Um, tensions between the United States and China mounted over uh, the advances in AI. That's been going on for some time. Now the focus is falling on this lab that Microsoft operates in Beijing. What's hmm. been the response of the company? Uh, well, it's interesting because Microsoft maintains that this is not a problem. It shouldn't have to shut down the lab or pull people out. But at the same time, it does have a backup system in place, which you would expect being an IT company. Uh, for business continuity, they've got a lab in Vancouver, on the west coast of Canada, where they could, if they needed, transfer their researchers. The big fear is having a laboratory based in Beijing exposes their research to infiltration, manipulation, classic espionage, et cetera, even weaponization. Mm. So is that tenable? That's what the US government has been asking it, Microsoft. This has been a pattern, though, the, 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 the accusation that China steals hmm. uh, intellectual properties. It's a consistent problem. What are the intelligence agencies saying about it? And, and, and do Microsoft lose people who have the expertise hmm. to other Chinese companies? Yeah, I mean, that's what's really funny is they were worried that one of the risks was Microsoft brings these wonderful researchers together, they work on great tech, and then they might leave and go work for a Chinese company. That already has been happening. And it also, it's not just going to Chinese companies, they might go to any tech company anywhere in the world. So that one doesn't really stand up, I think, as much this hemorrhaging of talent. I think the really big question is, what kind of technologies are they working on? And are they potential risks to national security from a US perspective or that of its allies? That is open for interpretation, because we're talking about things like facial recognition technology, which China uses to persecute Uyghur Muslims because they've got several million of them in concentration camps in the west of that country. Mm. So it's already a problem in China, mm. but we use it differently in the mm. US or here in the UK, for instance. Just looking at this quote from uh, Brad Smith, the president of Microsoft, he says, the lesson of history is that countries succeed when they learn from the world. Guardrails and controls are critical. Engagement is vital. So that really tells you where the board yeah. uh, is looking. Uh, it, it seems that the, the plant will at least stay open for a while. Let's talk about the AI death calculator. I mean, can that ever be a good thing? I'm not sure I want to know when I'm going to croak. Well, I have bad news for you, which is that somebody's already got you in their system. It's just they've been using actuarial tables, right, for years. So all this is doing is adding more data for them to potentially get a more accurate prediction. Well, so they're waiting for me to die, so they say, yeah. aha, told you. So if you. you were to go take out a loan right now, you might need to insure that loan. So somebody's going to take your medical well, history, your age, all of that. The implications of this are awful because you, if you take out life insurance, they say, huh, you're going to yeah. die at 55, then your premium goes up. Yeah, but that's already happening. So if you had like a very um, high adrenaline sports lifestyle, for instance, or if you were a regular smoker, a heavy drinker, all those things are already factored into things like getting insurance, mm. right? So all this does is give them, hopefully, greater accuracy. That's not to say that we can predict the exact date of your death, it's more of a probability that you would make it to 77 or 95, and that's taking in family history and all sorts of stuff. But this particular death GPT tool was trained on Danish data. 
And that's going to have very different data than we would have like here in the UK, where we have much worse health outcomes. Yeah, they right? eat more fish over there. <laughs> and, and they go. Yeah. Um, one thing we, you and I have always talked about uh, when it comes to AI is whether AI can track AI and whether it can deal with misinformation and spot deep fakes, that sort of thing. This story about U.S. intelligence tracking the hackers who might be targeting critical infrastructure, and I, I pulled out that, that, that point about the pipeline from New York to Texas because that was one instance that really set alarm bells ringing. Yes. So the hacking of critical infrastructure has always been a problem, and like with every other story that we cover, AI just ups the ante, right? It just makes it that much more sophisticated and harder. So hackers are using AI, and so are the people that are defending us from hackers, right? So law enforcement and the intelligence services. Now, what we're talking about here is we've got synthetic media. We've got deep fake voice. We've got deep fake image and video. We could probably come create an entire deep fake version of this program and do a massive misinformation campaign. Not hard, right? So what you have there is a risk of fraud. You have an increased risk of phishing. So when you get those emails that mm -hmm. send money, With you know, a pH. Yeah. yeah. And but you can say, oh, the spelling is not accurate, so it's probably not legit. That's harder to do now because the language pro programming is better. So. All of these things are leading to greater risks. It's harder to detect that you're dealing with a criminal than it was. What's interesting is that uh, the Amazon chief security officer, Stephen Schmidt, has said that they are going super aggressive on this, that, mm. that they think cybersecurity defense is, is where it's at. Yeah. I mean, it is, because it has to be. If the threat is increasing, the defense has to become more aggressive as well. So it's a great question of they're using the same tools. Who is going to get better? I would argue that, unfortunately, the hackers and the innovators are usually a little bit ahead. If you're playing defense, that can be a very difficult game. That said, Amazon's going to have some of the best people in the business working on it. So if anyone can do it, let's hope it's them. OK, um, let's talk about <laughs> fingerprints. I love CSI. I thought every fingerprint on every finger was different. I know. But according to Columbia University, no. We may because have to change well, the they've, plot. <laughs> well, they've, they've looked at 60,000 fingerprints and they fed them in pairs into this AI system, mm. which is known as Deep Contrastive Network. Yeah. And they found that the pairs that belong to the same person, which suggests they're not all that unique. Yeah. So. As you say, the sort of ground truth in the world of forensics is everybody's fingerprints are unique, even identical twins. Okay? So the way that the computer looks at something is different to how we would look at it. And that shows like it's all about your perspective in life, right? So they study fingerprints, human beings study fingerprints from the outside in. The computer is studying it from the inside out. Oh. That seems to be the shift in perspective that has yielded this result. And that just shows you this is a way that computers can maybe show us reality well, in a different but way. What does that mean? I mean, obviously, it's got in implications for forensic work. But what about, I mean, I use a fingerprint yeah. to get into my phone. Well, so that's actually an interesting one because, again, identical twins have been able to get into each other's phones using fingerprints and even face ID. So that's not 100 percent accurate anyhow. And it must be said also in forensics. It's to be really careful. I don't think anyone who's a police officer would say that's going to be the thing that's going to convict or not. Mm. It's used to generate leads. It's part of a parcel of circumstantial evidence. So we don't have to rewrite the plot of every CSI episode going forward yet. But mm. it's really exciting because you've got people who've maybe been wrongfully committed. You've got cases that have gone cold. Maybe this could generate new leads again. We've got a minute to talk about cartoons. I mean, I just presume that, uh, you know, animators would be put out of work because it creates art so easily, mm. AI. But according to those who are in the business, it doesn't do it as well as humans. Well, I mean, that's the thing is, is it a tool or is it a creator? I think I would argue right now it's a tool that human creators could use to make great comics. But? But the question is, can a computer learn to have a soul? Because that's what humans use to create great art. So it's a philosophical question, not a technical one. What a lovely way to leave the <laughs> programme, Stephanie Hare. Thank you very much indeed uh, for that. We got through all of that. Uh, lovely to have you with us. Uh, we will, of course, be back same time next week with AI Decoded.